The modern theater can be said to date from about 1875. Revolution was the byword of those times. Political revolution in the United States and in France, as well as the industrial and technological revolution that fostered an explosion of public communication. The telegraph was invented in 1830, the telephone in 1876, and the steam engine in 1769. As well as the growth and stabilization of modern med- medical practices and the growth of the middle class. There was also an intellectual revolution in science, philosophy, and social understanding with the works of Darwin and his theory of evolution, Sigmund Freud and his psychoanalysis, and Karl Marx and communism. The modern theater has its roots in these political, social, and intellectual revolutions that forever changed economic and social systems everywhere. Since its outset, it has been a theater of challenge, a theater of experimentation, not a theater of rules, of demigods, or heroes and villains. It reflects the confusion of its times and struggles to clarify and illuminate, to document and explore human destiny in a complex and uneasy universe. Realism has sought to create a drama without conventions or abstractions. Likeness to life is the goal of realism. Actors should be the character. Dialogue should be conversation. Scenery and sets should be lifelike, livable. Costumes should be real clothes. Characters in realism are drawn true to life and subject to their individual social states. The new hero of the realistic drama was perplexed and inarticulate in the face of many forces fighting for control of his or her soul. In essence, the realistic theater is conceived to be a laboratory in which a topic, be it the nature of relationships or the ills of society or the symptoms of a dysfunctional family, is set down for the final judgment of an audience. What the realistic theater movement did accomplish was a wholesale review of every aspect of stage production, playwriting, acting, directing, and design. Genres were blended. No longer was there the strict division of the neoclassic purely comic or purely tragic or the melodramatic good versus evil of the Romantic period. The scenery and costumes depicted ordinary living environments. Even the sets and costumes of realistic theater are intended to mimic life. The proscenium stage of the Romantic Theater was modified by the invention of box sets made exactly to scale with four-dimensional walls, real bookcases, fireplaces, etc., just as they are in a real house interior. A new aesthetic principle was developed, the theater of the fourth wall removed. The stage was conceived to be the same as in a real-world setting, except that one wall had been removed. Characters were drawn from everyday life, and we find the advent of the Stanislavski technique of acting. Playwrights openly sought to comment on immediate day-to-day issues. These were called problem plays because they dealt with current social issues or problems facing mankind. Realistic theater had its start in the second half of the 19th century, with the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen. Ibsen is known as the father of dramatic realism. His plays were populated by ordinary people with ordinary problems, played out in the interiors of ordinary homes. His plays shocked and dazzled Europe in the late 1800s, creating for the first time in theater history a multinational dramatic forum. The Russians, specifically the Moscow Arts Theater, are largely responsible for what we know today as realism. Two monumental figures of Russia were Stanislavski and Chekhov. Chekhov was a playwright, and his plays dealt with the end of Tsarist Russia. Chekhov's technique was to create deeply complex relationships between his characters and develop the plot and themes more or less between the lines. No one character could be regarded as the principal character. 
Rather, the play focused on the relationships between the characters. This is a notion that carried over into American realism. Realistic acting is the mode of realistic drama, and we have Konstantin Stanislavski to thank for the world-renowned Actors Studio in New York. We talked about Stanislavski and his contributions to realistic acting earlier this term. American realism was heavily influenced by these three, Ibsen, Stanislavski, and Chekhov. The first great American playwright was Eugene O'Neill. He was the first American to achieve international fame, winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1936 and Pulitzer Prizes for four of his plays, Beyond the Horizon in 1920, Anna Christie in 1922, Strange Interlude in 1928, and Long Day's Journey into Night in 1957. O'Neill is credited with raising American dramatic theater to an art form respected around the world. And Eugene O'Neill passed away in 1953. Arthur Miller succeeded O'Neill as America's most serious playwright. Miller is best known for the play Death of a Salesman from 1949, a play about the broken American dream. A lifelong liberal, Miller is known for the social awareness of his works. He was known as America's conscience. He passed away in 2005. Tennessee Williams is often paired with Miller when speaking about post-World War II theater in the United States, and they are certainly the best-known American playwrights. But whereas Miller deals with the socio-political issues of the day, Tennessee Williams is known for his brilliantly evocative and idealized characters, Characters that are often psychologically unable to cope with what they view as the brutalities of daily life. Williams has placed indelible characters into our national myth. There certainly can't be many of you who are unacquainted with the characters of Stanley Kowalski and Blanche Dubois from Williams' Streetcar Named Desire, or with the titles, if not the actual storylines, of his plays, The Glass Menagerie or Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. We become emotionally involved with his characters and their struggles with life. The anti-realistic movement has its roots in the artistic movement known as symbolism that began in the 1880s in Paris as a joint venture of artists, playwrights, essayists, critics, sculptors, and poets. If realism was the art of depicting reality as ordinary men and women might see it, then symbolism, in contrast, would explore, by means of images and metaphors, the inner realities that cannot be directly seen or literally perceived. Sigmund Freud's work on dream images and the unconsciousness were being published at this same time in the 1880s, and they provided a new source of material for the stage. Characters in symbolic drama were used to represent philosophical ideas or warring internal forces in the human soul, rather than true-to-life individuals. The realist versus the symbolist confrontation affected every aspect of theater production. Symbolist-inspired directors, designers, worked side-by-side with playwrights. They were drastically altering the art of the stage, and the stage decor to accommodate the new dramas that surged into the theaters. The advent of electrical stage lighting opened limitless opportunities for stylizing the drama, the use of spotlights, shadows, shading. Advances in technology plus trends in post-impressionism art led to dramatic changes in set design and costume design leading to exoticism and fantasy. The first third of the 1900s was, in fact, an era of isms. Surrealism, expressionism, absurdism, etc. An era with continued experimentation by movement 
seeking to redefine theatrical art. A successful play was not merely a play, but rather a forum for a cause. Dramatic art took on a new social and political significance in Europe and America. The era of isms gave way to the era of dramatic stylization, or what we today call anti-realistic theater, or stylized theater. The styles employed by these anti-realistic or stylized theaters come from anywhere and everywhere. The past, exotic cultures, present and future technologies. The modern theater artist is limited only by physical resources and individual imagination. In general, anti-realistic theater doesn't do away with realism, but it wields it in often unexpected ways and enhances it with symbol and metaphor, with parable and allegory. Further, it makes explicit use of the theatricality of the theater. In anti-realistic theater, or stylized theater, characters usually represent more than individual people or personality types. Modern stylized plays often involve characters who represent forces of nature, moral positions, human instincts, entities such as death or fate. The themes of anti-realistic theater are anxious ones. Most American plays these days are fueled by addiction, self-destruction, corruption, unfulfilled potential, and death. In other words, they're kind of dark. These particular stories touch our souls and reach into our collective consciousness as people. We lost one of our most beloved modern playwrights in July 2017, Sam Shepard. He wrote 44 plays, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1979 for his play Buried Child. Shepard's plays are chiefly known for their bleak, poetic, often surrealistic elements, black humor, and his rootless characters living on the outskirts of American society. One of the most successful current American playwrights is Tracy Letts. He also adapts his own plays for the screen, so perhaps you've actually seen some of his plays as movies. Bug, Killer Joe, August Osage County, and the television show Superior Donuts. If you haven't seen them, you may soon. <laughs>